Human civilization, despite its flaws and harmful impacts on many ecosystems, is the biosphere's best hope of avoiding premature destruction. These are some controversial words from our next distinguished guest, Dr. Kareem Jabari. He's an author, a lecturer, and a researcher at the Institute for Future Studies. In our conversation, we dove into climate ethics and why our actions today will determine how many human beings will actually have the opportunity to live in the future. We discuss the search for intelligent life in our universe and why humanity may fall into a Hobbesian trap by recklessly advertising our location to the rest of the universe. Finally, we dive into the ever-present topic on everyone's mind, artificial intelligence, and the theory of an intelligence explosion, as well as humanity's struggle to create limits and guardrails for one of the most powerful forces that we may ever create. My name is Robert Roach, and this is the Type 1 Planet Podcast. Please join this conversation. Follow us on our social media accounts, reach out to us on our website, type1planet.net. We are looking for new guests, for new minds, and for new people who are interested in joining this movement and to create a network across this planet of like-minded individuals who are interested in investing in the future of humanity and the future of the biosphere on this planet. All right. Hello and welcome to the Type 1 Planet podcast. I'm Robert Roach and I'm joined by our guest today, Dr. Kareem Jabari. He's an author a lecturer and a researcher at the Institute for Futures Studies. And he's calling in from Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, Kareem, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. So uh, we're going to dive right into this. There's a lot of stuff that you are, have written on um, that you've worked on, especially in terms of existential risk, in terms of artificial intelligence. Um, we're going to begin with climate because you, you've done some research and some in writing, and I believe you are writing or have already released a book on climate uh, uh, ethics and climate change, is that correct? Um, I'm uh, in the process of writing it, but it's partly based on a contribution that I made to an anthology that was published here in Sweden uh, a year ago. Okay, great. And I think I know what that, I, I will list, list that in the show notes for people to check out. Um, so I want to begin with a controversially, potential controversial statement that I found in some of your writing. You, uh, you wrote that we argue that human civilization despite its flaws and harmful impacts on many ecosystems, uh, is the biosphere's best hope for avoiding premature destruction. So let's start there. Why is a technologically advanced human civilization better for the Earth's natural environment and then not existing at all? Well, it's uh, so this argument is um, takes a, a look at the long-term future of uh, the biosphere uh, and the Earth system. Um, and uh, uh, what we know from um, research on solar evolution and, and different kinds of stars is that the sun is going to be become more and more uh, warm and more and more luminous. Uh, and this increased luminosity is over time going to destroy the uh, Earth ecosystem. And there are some disagreements of how long this will take because um, we can expect that many of these Earth systems uh, can adapt since it's a very slow change. Uh, some people say that it could be uh, within 800 million years. Some people say it can take up to one and a half billion years, uh, but it's in that range. Uh, so what uh, me and my co-author Anders Sandberg, who I think was in the show before, um, what we argue in that paper is that if we care about the ecosystem and assign normative value or moral value to the ecosystem existing, uh, then we should also care about about it existing in this long-term future. And at the moment, the only uh, species or the yeah the, the only one who can prevent this destruction, as far as we know, is uh, human civilization. If human civilization would cease to exist, then we will also uh, have to expect that the uh, biosphere would cease to exist in, in this time range. Uh, so what we do in the paper is that, that we go through some you know, hypothetical uh, means that uh, a, a future civilization could use to prolong the expected lifespan of the biosphere. And uh, according to some views, it could expand the, uh, the life of the biosphere for up to a billion years. So it's a big difference. Can you talk about some of those hypothetical means for extending the life of the biosphere? Sure. So one of the kind of uh, more uh, low tech means uh, would be some form of very advanced geoengineering in the same kind of um, geoengineering that we are talking about with regards to climate change. 
putting a sulfur into the stratosphere. That is obviously not a very good long-term solution. Uh, but other possibilities would include putting up uh, uh, mirrors or shields in in um, the Lagrange point, uh, that is the stable point between Earth and the Sun. That, that's the point where if you put something there, the, the, the object is going to be in equilibrium between the Earth and Sun gravity. So you don't need to use that much fuel to, to keep it there. So the idea would be to, if you create a large enough sun shield, then you would block um, sol incoming solar energy and reduce the temperature on Earth. Uh, so that could counteract this in, uh, this global warming that would be triggered by by luminosity, increased luminosity. That's fact. I, I remember, I think maybe in the uh, inter interview with Anders, we created a clip where he's talking about, you know, the eventual destruction of Earth, but at the hands of the sun. And someone commented, they were like, what about mirrors and shields in space that deflect that? Uh, the, the fact the sun's rays and I was like, this is a ridiculous notion. And then I looked online and there are people who are looking into this, you know, it's a fascinating concept. I mean, it's not something that we can do now, uh, but the point is that we have plenty of time. So we have, uh, you know, 800 to a billion years to think this over. Uh, and, uh, you know, assuming that we survive, it's not an implausible proposition that this could be uh, done. At some point in the far future, and it's you know, it's a uh, the the sun shield would have to be pretty big, uh, but you don't have to build it all at once. And uh, you know, if you put up uh, a few square uh, meters per year, then that would suffice uh, over time. Mm. Uh, so it, it, it might sound outlandish, but we're talking about such time scales that it's actually not that outlandish. Assuming that we survive, of course, mm. that's kind of that premise. Uh, isn't I guess. That would count, I get, because I was thinking about the global cooling uh, element of blocking a significant amount of energy from the sun, but might be counterbalanced by an expansion of the sun to a certain extent. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Now, aren't these hypothetical means uh, in some way just buying time versus actually solving a solution such as, if my mind says, well, we got to take biodiversity off Earth in order to actually... Uh, survive an expansion, a sun's expansion. Is that, I mean, are we buying time or are we fixing a, a problem with these means? Uh, no, we're just buying time. Okay. And in the end, that's that's all we can ever do. I mean, if, if, even if we'd colonize the entire universe, you know, that would not last forever either. Uh, it's just that we would be buying lots more time. Um, but uh, no, we're buying time. But, you know, if you fit, if you think that uh, it's, it, that biodiversity and the ecosystem and the ecosphere is valuable, then you know an additional billion years is not too bad. Mm. Uh, even if it's you know fi a finite amount, but it's a, a, a decent chunk in any case. And the reason why we're only postponing and not preventing this outcome is that the sun is going uh, to eventually expand and become a red giant. And at that point, it's likely that it will either directly interfere with the uh, orbit of the Earth, of Earth, uh, or that it will, some, uh, in other ways, um, disturb the orbit of Earth. And at that point, it seems uh, very unlikely that there's anything that that could be done, uh, right. even even kind of in the most uh, optimistic scenarios. But uh, with regard to your other question. Uh, co uh, colonizing or spreading life to other planets is certainly another thing that uh, that could be extremely valuable if you believe that uh, biodiversity and ecosystems are valuable. But in this paper, we wanted to focus on the Terran ecosystem or the, this particular ecosystem, because there are some people in environmental ethics that although they recognize uh, uh, that creating additional ecosystems have some value, have some positive contribution. Um, protecting this ecosystem is for them more important. Like we should protect what we have before we, uh, you know, buy new stuff or do new stuff. So, so that's why we wanted to focus on protecting. But of course, that that possibility is certainly, uh, yeah, also open doors if we would survive. Yeah, uh, the Type One Planet uh, organization is team of protecting what we have, <laughs> and and seeing is it possible to reach a sustainable state that can last for thousands of years on Earth with the environment. Um, and so let's talk about buying that time in a short term order, I guess you could say, with the uh, with climate change and climate ethics. Um, so what are your primary focuses in terms of uh, research for for the climate? What are you looking at? 
Yeah, so I'm writing a book now on uh, the climate crisis uh, as a social and political crisis, because I feel like a lot of emphasis in public debate and public discourse has been on the climate crisis as an environmental crisis. And what I argue in the book is that for typical, let's say a typical environmental crisis, there are somebody who's dumping toxins in a local lake. Then the harmful effects of that crisis are directly mediated by the toxins. So people get sick or something like that. Um, with regards to the climate crisis, we have an Im immediate direct effect, increased heat and uh, changing weather patterns and so on. And those are going to cause a lot of harm and already cause a lot of harm. But what why I, what I argue is that the secondary uh, effects of the climate crisis, the effects on um, uh, involuntary mass migration, uh, local conflicts, uh, political instability, economic stagnation, um, um, you know, maybe great power conflicts, uh, and so on. Those are the the, the most uh, terrifying, or the most uh, the risks that should concern us the most. So w what I argue in the book is that we, we have this phenomena or this crisis that is increasing temperature and is putting a lot of stress on a lot of different um, systems. Um, and it can be you know, agriculture in poor countries, it could be uh, migration, it could be conflict, it could be water scarcity, um, fires and uh, natural disasters. And when combined, those can produce these um, um, what, the, what, for example, economic historian uh, Adam Tooze calls a polycrisis. That is a crisis where uh, many uh, smaller catastrophes uh, reinforce each other and um, become worse than they would otherwise be and become like a mega crisis. Mm -hmm. Is this a conversation about how we handle, how we mitigate climate change? Or is this a conversation about how our civilization adapts to climate change because I think those might be well, one is is actively saying we have the ability to stem this change, and then one is saying the change is going to happen one way or another, even if it's in a couple million years. How do we structure our civilization so that it can be more adaptable? There's less things like economic st stagnation, political instability, mass migration, or you can plan for those things in advance. Where, from what uh, way are you approaching this conversation? So uh, my main approach would be to mitigate or to reduce climate risk, because uh, while it is certain that we're going to get a certain degree of uh, global warming, that's already uh, it's already happened, and even if we would cease all CO two emissions and greenhouse gas emissions, we would still get some additional warming. Uh, so we need to do some adaptation. Uh, so and that is super important. But what's really dangerous and what really worries me is the systemic shocks of the uh, kind of fat tail or, or low probability, high impact scenarios that the IPCC uh, has outlined in the reports. So assuming a um, you know that we reach a total emissions level at uh, maybe 600 uh, ppm, uh, 600 to 700 ppm, which is not unlikely. Um, we could have a considerable chance of getting up to four or maybe five degrees warming. Um, the, the, there are various models that, that test the climate sensitivity and so on, but the, the risk of getting up to five degrees warming uh, for uh, 700 ppm uh, is, is uh, not negligible. I think it's around 10%. 10%. And just, just for the audience member who doesn't understand what you're referring to when you say ppm, what are you saying there? Right. So PPM is parts per million. So that's like how much of the atmosphere is carbon dioxide. And at the moment, we're at 400 PPM. We had 260 PPM when uh, the Industrial Revolution started. And uh, often the scenarios that are being made uh, I, I depart from the assumption that uh, we should avoid doubling the amount from pre-industrial levels. And uh, that's going from 260 to 560. So we should definitely avoid 560 and preferably stop at you know 450 at the most. Uh, I, but many people believe that it might be unlikely that we stop at 450 and 560 and that we could even reach 600. And that would be really bad. Uh, so, so I think that avoiding those um, extreme emission scenarios is uh, the main focus because uh, the assumption or the argument that I'm making is that climate harm 
is not um, proportional to um, temperature increases. Climate harm increases much more. And we don't know much how much more, but uh, we can expect that, you know, it's much worse to go from three to four degrees of than going from two to three degrees. Uh, so an analogy would be like, imagine that you're crashing in a car in uh, 30 kilometers per hour. Uh, sorry, for, I'm using no, the, okay. <laughs> the Swedish uh, European system here. But if you, if you crash in a car at 30 kilometers per hour, uh, according to, you know, probability estimates, there, there's about a 5% chance of you dying. Uh, but if you crash in a car at 60 kilometers per hour, there's uh, a, a much higher risk. I think it's 60% risk of, of dying. So a doubling of the speed uh, leads to uh, a, a huge increase, a 12-fold increase, I think, if I'm counting correctly. In my head. It's a huge increase in the risk of death. And I think this is, this is how we could think about climate change. That you know, It's not that I'm saying that two degrees are, is okay or fine, but the difference between two and three degrees is considerable, and the, the difference between three and four is much bigger, and four and five is even bigger. Uh, so uh, um, we should both focus on adaptation because some climate change is inevitable, but we should most of all try to minimize the risk of these extreme outcomes. Mm. This is so. This is interesting. I'm learning a little bit about climate science, which might be helpful for listeners. Um, you are measuring how many particles per million particles in an average. Uh, are you, can I ask what part of the atmosphere this is taken from? This is is your where are you taking those uh, samples? Sea level. Oh, sea, sea level. level. Okay, got it. Yeah. Um, and then you're able to say, okay, if there's a certain amount of parts per million, then so far we've seen this amount of change with this level of change of parts per million. This, uh, this amount of change, yeah. for example, with global temperatures, which have uh, certain obvious uh, effects on our on our weather, for example. And if you're saying, okay, if we get up to 560 parts per million, are you able to uh, theoretically map out how much temperature change is going to happen to the global climate and then what kinds of effects that would have on our weather? Well, yes, this is what the climate scientists are trying to do. And it's very difficult because there are a lot of uncertainties involved. Uh, the climate system is a dynamic, a chaotic system and so on. So it's, it's very difficult. Yeah. Uh, so th there's this term that the climate scientists use uh, that's called climate sensitivity. And climate sensitivity is uh, the um, the amount or the degree to which uh, climate will change for any amount of carbon dioxide released into the atmosphere. Um, and uh, so if we go from 260, uh, um, to, uh, 280 to 560, uh, how much more temperature increase will we get? Hmm. And the uh, as far um, as far as I know, um, the uh, m uh, the mean uh, no the median estimate is that if we go to five sixty, there's going to be a three degree uh, of warming uh, for five sixty ppm, uh, three degree warming in in by twenty one hundred about you know it's not exact, um, but that's just the the the. Uh, the median estimate. There's considerable risk that the uh, that the temperature increase might be uh, higher, like four or even maybe four and a half degrees. However, if we go past five sixty, go past a doubling, then the risk of having these more extreme outcomes also increases proportionally. Okay, got it. So we are experiencing climate change now. We understand some of its effects. And we're saying there are certain things that we need to do. We need to stem the amount of uh, parts per million, the amount of particles that are actually in our atmosphere. And so let's dive into suggestions and solutions, but also dive into kind of some ethical concerns. And what that's something I was excited to talk to you about is climate ethics, uh, particularly in regard to the population. Um, and because this is a sensitive subject, people don't want to be told not to have children or anything along those lines. So, but do you have any research relating to the amount of people that Earth can sustain before we start to teeter out and out of control? Um, and I think you wrote what what the present generation should do with regard to climate change would not just have an impact on future generations, but also determine who and how many people exist in the future. Is the size of our population a part of this uh, this conversation? 
It is, um, but I think that it's uh, un it's unfortunate. Um, I, I think that um, population changes are often very slow. Uh, the demographers call this uh, population momentum um, because uh, consider the case with um, uh, with a uh, developing country with with a very young population, say Nigeria. Even if they would immediately reduce the average family size to, say, two children uh, per woman. Since they, their population is already very young, I mean, the, the, a, a large chunk of their population hasn't entered into child-rearing age yet. So no matter, um, even if we reduce the average family size to two uh, children, their population is still going to grow a lot because of the population structure that they have. Uh, whereas countries on the other end, like Japan, even if uh, Japanese people, um, like prospective Japanese mothers, would start having lots of children, it would take a very long time for the Japanese population to start growing because the uh, the women that are like entering into their child um, childbearing age uh, become a twenty. They're just a, such a small fraction of the population at this point. So, so this is what. What they what uh, demographers call population momentum that population is like a big uh, you know uh, an aircraft carrier that can turn slowly but you know but when it turns it it, it does have a lot of uh, you know umph to it uh, so but but the upshot for for the climate crisis is that if we want to uh, reduce uh, we want to reduce uh, greenhouse gases now and not in fifty years so we want to uh, reduce uh, greenhouse gases to zero. Uh, net zero by 2050, and that's uh, you know that means we have 37 years, and so changes in population policy could have an effect down the line, but they are clearly insufficient because they're going to just be too slow. So that's one aspect of why I believe that focusing on population is unfortunate. Another aspect, and maybe maybe more important, is that there are such huge discrepancies in how much uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, are produced uh, depending on your level of income and wealth. Uh, so, uh, an average uh, person in India, for example, emits uh, about um, two tons of CO2 per year, uh, whereas uh, an average European is 10 tons and an average American is uh, 20 tons. But that's just an average. Uh, if you look at the uh, wealthiest 10%, we're talking about hundreds and some of, you know, up to 1,000 tons per year. Uh, so reducing the um, the emissions of the uh, wealthiest is far more effective, both in terms of like productivity, human freedom, but also impact than reducing the uh, the number of people in poor countries. Because that's also the third aspect that when we're talking about um, you know popul the the issue of population, it almost always makes uh, people in poor countries into I wouldn't say targets, but they become the focal point for this discussion. Uh, people in Nigeria, people in, in Kenya, and so on and so forth. And it, it, while it's certainly true that they have a high rate of population growth, uh, it also uh, you know scapegoats them or, or makes them targets for um, policies that, although not meant to be coercive and oppressive, uh, often end up being that. So an example of that is uh, India had a, a very... Uh, a major family planning uh, program um, in the post-war years uh, during the Cold War, and although it was, it's often compared favorably with China's very, very coercive uh, one-child policy. India's program was not, uh, you know, uh, nice. <laughs> it was not liberal in 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 many respects. Many people got uh, forced abortions. Many people got uh, forced implants of IUDs. Uh, forced sterilizations were not uncommon, or coerced sterilizations. So these programs tend to, uh, even though they are well-meaning and they're formulated by like liberal technocrats, they are often implemented on the ground by people that have very, you know, racist or classist or sexist views on poor women, and these poor women tend up to tend to get, uh, you know, targeted with with very coercive, mm. uh, coercive means. I and. Uh a big argument in my mind is, is I mean, first of all, it seems like even though our population is growing, a lot of these uh, highly developed countries, their populations seem to be on the decline or, or slowing. And, uh, but the, the big question 
in my mind is, are, is it wrong to be focusing on, for example, we in America, we love to do this, is uh, the average American citizen wants to feel like they're contributing to uh, helping with the climate crisis by buying a really expensive Tesla or, you know, like something like that. And uh, from my perspective, you know, for example, the U.S. military creates as much or something, it's some insane amount of carbon per year that matches the entire population of the United States. Um, is this a governmental policy question or is this a behavioral question in terms of the average uh, human uh, spread out throughout the world? So, yeah, I, I definitely fall into the uh, camp of, of this being a structural, political, governmental issue. Uh, and maybe it's not shocking, I'm from Sweden and so on and so forth, maybe we have that reputation. But I, I think that the problem with doing transforming this into an individual issue is that um, uh, climate change is an issue, it's a collective action problem. It's a problem that is the result of many people acting independently of each other uh, to attain a good of their own. And, uh, a, a similar problem or a problem that has similar structure is, uh, for example, traffic jams. So the best way to stop a traffic jam is not for you to stay home, right? Because if you stay home uh, and don't take the car to work, then it will become a bit more attractive for someone else who would have abstained from driving their car to work to uh, drive car, uh, his or her car to work. So as an individual, there's not much you can do. Uh, what you can do is that you can try to coordinate with other individuals and and together uh, reduce traffic in some way. And the good news is that we have this really, really powerful and effective organization at coordinating individual actions. And we call them the state <laughs> or the government. Uh, the government is basically a tool for coordinating individual efforts. So that's why I think that uh, if you if you want to make a change, and I think you should want to make a change in this issue, I would urge you to uh, become uh, politically active to try to you know join a party, donate to um, to progressive uh, in in the climate sense uh, representatives, or or try to uh, you know uh, build up grassroots organizations and so on and so forth. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, politics in the United States is a little. You you might need to. Some craziness in your own head to want to join the U.S. polity, but anyway. Uh, so uh, I want to um, change gears a little bit from climate, um, and because we only have so much time, maybe we can jump on and do another call and continue this, especially when your book is out, um, and explore some of the other amazing things that you've done research on um, in the same vein as, as existential risk, and also in terms of futurism, looking into the deep future. Um, there's one topic that everyone loves and is kind of popular right now, uh, especially on Twitter. It's, it seems to be uh, trending every day is uh, UFOs and aliens and um, the search for intelligent life. And um, something that you wrote, I, I did a video once on a concept called the dark forest hypothesis. Have you heard of this? Right? Yeah, of course you have. And so uh, and it reminded I was reminded of the dark forest hypothesis when I was looking at one of your papers and you talk about a Hobbesian trap in terms of advertising our location to extraterrestrial life. So I wanted to ex explore what are you referring to when you say Hobbesian trap and what does our search for intelligent life strategy look like from your perspective? Yeah, thanks. So this this paper was very fun to write. Um, so the Hobbesian trap is a concept from game theory uh, that was um, articulated by uh, the uh, economist and Nobel laureate uh, um, uh, Thomas Schelling. And it's based on uh, on previous work by Thomas Hobbes, uh, as the name suggests. And the idea is that um, imagine the following game theoretical situation. Uh, you and I uh, are in the forest and we want to uh, eat some, we want food. And we have two choices. We can cooperate with each other and then we could uh, take down a deer or if we mistrust each other, we could uh, go each on our own and then we would find a hare who could eat a hare. Um, but if I choose to trust you, uh, but you don't trust me, then you will get a hare and I will get nothing. And vice versa. If you trust uh, uh, me uh, and I don't trust you, then uh, I will get a hare and you will get uh, nothing. So this is not the prisoner's dilemma. 
right? This is a bit different from the prisoner's dilemma because in the prisoner's dilemma, um, there's only one equilibrium. In the prisoner's dilemma, regardless of what you do, I uh, I benefit from defecting. I benefit from telling the cops or whoever that uh, that you're a bad guy. And whatever I do, you benefit from ratting me out. So that's a prisoner's dilemma, right? There's no opportunity for cooperation. In the game I described, there is an opportunity for cooperation, and that's if we trust each other, we'll hunt a deer, and we'll be much more uh, happy with that than if we would uh, hunt a rabbit. So in, in the game that I described, uh, the uh, it's called the stag hunt. So it's not a deer, it's a ta- stag, actually. Uh, there are two equilibria. There's the payoff dominant equilibria. That's why we both uh, hunt for a stag. And the risk dominant equilibria, which is when we go on our own ways and, and uh, chase the rabbit or uh, the hare. Uh, so uh, what does that, this have to do with aliens? Well, the same game can be used to, uh, to model arms races and was used to model arms races during the Cold War. So let's say that we're two superpowers. And that means that the, the best thing for both of us is that we trust each other and we don't spend lots of money on arms race. On an arms race, we, we buy butter for, for our uh, citizens. Uh, so butter is instead of guns. But if we mistrust each other, then we both uh, invest in guns. And that means that we're no bad, we're worse off than we would be otherwise be. But we avoid the risk of being in a situation of having bought butter when the other gun, the guy bought guns. Right? Because then we will, we're pretty bad off. The other guy can steal our butter or whatever. Uh, so, so you can use the same model to, uh, to analyze a potential interaction with an extraterrestrial intelligence. So let's say we have an extraterrestrial civilization nearby, like in Proxima Centauri or Tau Ceti or something like that. Um, we can uh, you know, cooperate. Uh, and in this scenario, cooperation would mean not attack, maybe, you know, try to exchange information or you know do something nice together. Or we could try a, a unilateral first strike, uh, which be the uh, kind of defection, uh, the defection alternative. And, um, and uh, the problem with the Hobbesian trap or what Schelling said was that when you have two players in a game and the players can't communicate with each other, uh, then uh, the, um, the, the risk dominant option the, the the unilateral first strike, the the arms race or the chasing of hares, that becomes a so-called focal point. So our attention is directed at that outcome and becomes the kind of most likely outcome. So uh, so that's pretty bad news. That means that uh, if if uh, if we find an extraterrestrial intelligence and found ourselves in a game like this, and there are some additional assumptions that have to be made, but then it would mean that we should expect that civilization to launch a first strike, according to the paper. However, I'm writing a new paper that uh, criticizes the uh, conclusions of that paper, where I reach a more optimistic conclusion. <laughs> okay, nice, interesting. So, um, yeah. you've, 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 have you encountered new data, or have you just been continuing to think on it and, and found some some different perspectives in that consideration? Okay. I, I continue to think about it, uh, and the, the, the new paper includes uh, a reasoning on <clears throat> uh, on selection effects, observation selection effects. So the argument is that if there is there is uh, a, an ex- if we say that we would find an extraterrestrial intelligence on Tau Ceti or Proxima Centauri, very close nearby, then we have to either assume that our place in the galaxy is very special because there's like only two aliens here and and uh, and uh, and they happen to be very close together or we have to conclude that there are actually lots of aliens out there because otherwise it would be like quite a coincidence if if there are very few aliens how come they're so close to each other so if we believe then that there are lots of aliens out there then we can ask the following question that um, if there are lots of aliens out there surely some of those should be quite advanced and how come we're still around? I mean, it, it, not, we're imagining a, a galaxy with maybe millions or billions of of civilizations out there, and and many of those could have you know wiped us out many many years ago. So how come they haven't? And the only uh, 
well, the, 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 the kind of simplest conclusion that you can infer from that is that there's some mechanism, there's something that prevents civilizations from ex uh, killing each other from from history. We don't know exactly what that mechanism is. Could be a combination of things, but there's something that prevents civilizations from killing each other in that scenario. And then we can use that conclusion or that inference to guide us in the in the game, in the game that we have between uh, us and the ETI. And if we start from the assumption that civilizations generally don't uh, wipe each other out, then we can also make an assumption about that particular uh, civilization and say they're not likely to wipe us out. And then we can get the Hobbesian trap in, in reverse because we think that they are not going to wipe us out and we think that they think that we're not going to wipe them out. And, th and that makes us less likely to think that they're going to wipe us out. So if you start from an optimistic assumption of the uh, likely behavior of the other uh, player in a game, then you uh, then you change the focal point from the risk-dominant equilibrium, from the equilibrium that says that we should make a unilateral attack. You change the focal point from that equilibrium to the payoff-dominant equilibrium, uh, the one that says that we should have invest in, in butter and not guns. So we're using uh, the example that we have, which is that we exist and continue to exist so far as potentially data that if there is a significant amount of life out there, then the fact that we're still here points to some sort of uh, opposing view to the, the, the Hobbesian trap that you kind of, uh, okay, got it. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's difficult to, some people really struggle with why we're even talking about this. If they understand the distance between, for example, stars and, and how, you know, even recognizing somehow that there was like through the James Webb telescope that we were able to see evidence of like a Dyson sphere or, or, or some sort of wreckage so far away that we will never, ever be able to get there potentially in the next million years. And, and, you know, does the, do those considerations come into your mind when you are, are thinking about this? Because I do have a perspective on this, but I just wanted to ask you first, what's your perspective on the, the sheer vastness of space in terms of what you're talking about? Is that the reason why we haven't seen anything? It's just, it's too big. There's no way to get to each other. <laughs> sure. Um, no, uh, you're certainly uh, right there. I mean, uh, space is very big and uh, it's, uh, you know, uh, yeah, uh, that's certainly a reason to expect that if there are civilizations far away, uh, you know, in another galaxy or, or far away, thousands of light years away, that we're not going to have much interactions with them. We're not we don't have to be so much so concerned about them attacking us. We're probably not going to be able to attack them, and that's fine. So they're, they're like not here, or they're not around in any uh, practical sense. Uh, but the scenario I'm describing is a scenario where we find extraterrestrial intelligence in a nearby star. Uh, so there's actually, a, from the kind of practical perspective or the threat perspective, there's a considerable difference in you know, Tau Ceti is only 12 light years away. Proxima Centauri is four light years away. Uh, there are many stars um, that that could potentially host life, especially if we assume that that there could be uh, life around red dwarfs that are, um, um, you know, within 100 light years. If any of those had an advanced civilization, then, then, then that civilization could uh, pose uh, potentially a problem. Uh, and in the literature, or, or like you know, the, there's this genre of uh, futurist uh, future studies that uh, Anders Sandberg and others have, have done a lot, in, and including me. It's called the exploratory engineering, and the 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 idea with with exploratory engineering is try to ask like what would be possible with uh, like within the, the the laws of physics that we know of what could be done, and and you know the Dyson sphere is one one such result. You know, it, it's theoretically possible that you could build a Dyson sphere. Well, the other results from explore, exploratory engineering point to the possibility of launching so-called kinetic impactors. And a kinetic impactor is a weapon. So it could be like a rod of, of, of some heavy metal, like tungsten or, or something like that, that you accelerate to uh, a fraction of the speed of light, say half the speed of light. And at that speed, uh, a, a chunk of metal, let's say a, few, a ton of metal, would have such 
energy that you don't need a payload because the speed becomes the weapon. And an old impact, if, if a, say, a ton of tungsten would slam into the earth, uh, that would create tremendous havoc. It, we're talking about many, many uh, Tsar bombas, ma many uh, thermonuclear um, explosions. And, and you know, a, a, an advanced civilization could hypothetically accelerate many of those objects uh, and, and launch a barrage of, of, uh, of stuff. Which could be here in 10 years if they're coming from Alpha Centauri, potentially. Okay, got it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, that's that's crazy. <laughs> that's yeah, crazy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, interesting. And um, I, I think that doing these thought experiments is in no way a waste of time because what it does is it allows us the opportunity, the rare opportunity to consider ourselves as a species reacting to something that is outside it allows us to have a unification event even if it's a theoretical unification event where we are a species that exists on a planet this is our planet and you know that that's why i think the search for intelligent life is so important because even if you find microbes on another planet you're able to say there's an earth biosphere and then there's another biosphere out there and it gives us perspective on how important and how unique our own biosphere is that exists in this way um so i have I, I love that you're doing that and please let me know when that second paper is out is it already out uh, it's under review okay, uh, so uh, yeah it will be out soon hopefully <laughs> just, i just have to ask there's a lot of uh you know buzz about the ua uaps um that are being seen off of the coast of virginia and these these circulating tic tacs that are moving in ways that are beyond our understanding of of physics uh do, do those come up in conversation when you're sitting down with people like anders and you know having a coffee or something like that what what what's the perspective from from your side on those things well my view well it's a kind of a very classical view maybe boring it's that you know extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence and um, i find that this evidence is not very extraordinary um it's like the, the pictures are you know, very poor quality, uh, you know, and, and those kind of things. And and it's also the the reason why I think this claim is extraordinary is uh, partly due to what you mentioned before, the vast distances, right? So, um, I think if you like, my, my my gut feeling is that there's probably no, uh, there are very few uh, extraterrestrial civilizations. That that if there had been extraterrestrial civilizations nearby, let's say on Tau Ceti and Proxima, then we would have seen more evidence of their existence. Uh, so that's kind of my gut feeling. It's not a kind of a rigorous one. So so I imagine that, assuming that that uh, we would need to assume that these uh, civilizations are sending these UAPs uh, over very very large distances. Uh, and you know, just you know, hanging out in in the atmosphere, and it just sounds nonsensical to me. <laughs> why would they do that? Right. I mean, if, if they want to spy on us, they, why why are they not in in uh, uh, Leo, a low, low Earth orbit? I mean, why would they send something to the atmosphere? I, I don't know. I just uh, yeah, yeah. The only thing I can think of is that what if if they were sent here, they were sent here back when billions of years ago, or you know, a long time ago when. Okay. Oh, it looks like there's a signature of oxygen in this atmosphere. Let's send some devices mm. that will wake up if there's a thermonuclear explosion, and then they wake up and start sending data back. But it's just—it's so crazy. <laughs> it's—it's a fun sure. experiment. But no, no, no. I mean, it's certainly a poss possibility, and you know, you can tell a lot of uh, stories about it. But but then again, it's still an extraordinary claim, and and you need extraordinary evidence. All right. Let's hope some more evidence comes out. Then until then, let's. We'll keep moving forward here on some other things we're, we're human beings are trying to create some life of our own uh with artificial intelligence uh we don't know where this is going to go and there's a lot that's happening right now chat gbt4 just came out and uh there's some fun things that people are playing with but in terms of vastly advanced artificial intelligence i don't think we've seen that but um there are some you know, postulations for in, an intelligence explosion. Uh, people like Nick Bostrom had popularized these sorts of phrases. And you say that 
uh, we cannot, we can actually constrain um, intelligence explosions and that we can control that, like a controlled explosion, so to speak. Uh, what What is it that that you are concerned with in terms of artificial intelligence and uh, in terms of behavior and, and the governance? And then also, what is it that you're proposing that we might be able to do to better approach the development of artificial intelligence? Yeah, thanks. No, so what um, the so so maybe we have to distinguish a little bit between the kind of old debate about superintelligence, the debate that uh, Elias Rutkowski and Robin Hanson and Nick Bostrom was involved in uh, in the uh, early tens uh, and late uh, um, yeah uh, a while ago, um, and the contemporary debate. So and I've been kind of more focused on the first debate. So the the original idea that was. Uh, Put forward by Elias Yudkowsky was that um, if you if you consider human intelligence, that there's a very we tend to think that there's a big difference in intelligence between you know Einstein and a, and a below average stupid person, uh, but in fact uh, th that difference is only big if from an anthropocentric point of view. You know, it's it's big for us because we care about those people. Uh, but if you compare the intelligence of a human and a dog or a, or an ant, you see that the, the the gap is much bigger. So the argument w was that if you have an a, a an AI that reaches into human level, that reaches AGI, the you know the village idiot level, uh, it will surpass Einstein or or von Neumann or like genius level in a very short period of time. Uh, if we kind of step back from the anthropocentric point of view, and I thought it was this was an interesting claim, so I wanted to to consider it in, in greater detail. And and a, a counter that we make uh, that we say that that maybe it's not going to be as quick and fast as as Yudkowsky and and Bostrom argue is that uh, when we consider human intelligence, were when they consider human intelligence, they're just looking to the kind of biological intelligence of humans, what, what humans can do with their brains. And with respect to that, there's a big difference between the village idiot and Einstein. But um, what we care about in the context of controlling AI is not the kind of biological brain uh, of humans, the you know, uh, bio-intelligence. What we care about is the capacities of humans to contain an AI. And humans can, first of all, we can cooperate. So organizations are vastly more intelligent in that kind of capacity sense than uh, individuals. But also uh, advanced organizations like the CIA or, or the US military, they also have access to very advanced computers, uh, to, to narrow AI systems that can vastly enhance their capacities. So you could say that AI is not enhancing our intelligence in the kind of biological sense, of course, but it is enhancing our capacity to exert control over an AGI or a, a or super intelligence. So what we're saying is that um, if we if we just consider the bio intelligence, so we're going to be much more pessimistic about human the human potential to control AI. But we if we kind of take a step back and consider all the options that human organizations have, especially like the best most advanced human organizations, then we should be maybe less pessimistic about those organizations' uh, chances of controlling an, a superintelligence. Uh, so, so that was kind of the, the, the argument in, in, a, yeah, okay. uh, in short. And you've, you've used a phrase in your writing called a responsibility gap in terms of artificial intelligence. Can you um, describe what that, that gap is? Yeah, so this is more concerned with near-term artificial intelligence, like self-driving cars and so on. And in the literature, there's this discussion of you know what would happen, or what what happens, or what? How should we think about a situation where a self-driving car uh, kills someone? Who is responsible? Uh, and uh, there's been this claim made by especially lawyers, but also some philosophers, that a responsibility gap uh, opens up. And responsibility gap in this context means that you know that a wrong was made, somebody was killed. Um, and somebody should be held responsible, but there's nobody that can be held responsible. Uh, and so we have a gap. Uh, and this is by some considered as a big problem. And what I argue is that um, many philosophers and lawyers tend to mystify the whole AI 
debate and the whole AI discussion. And and I argue that there is no responsibility. And as a as an analogy, I take the case with elevators. Uh, so elevators were the first uh, vehicle to be uh, autonomous or to become autonomous about a hundred years ago. And because before that, you had a, a a guy who pushed the button or there was a lever that controlled the ele- elevator. And then you know uh, the elevators became autonomous uh, after uh, some time, uh, some technology developed. And then you remove the guy that pulls the lever. So who's responsible in that case? Well, it depends. It depends on what kind of failure it was. Maybe it was the uh, the owner of the company that sold the elevator. Maybe it's the owner of the building that didn't uh, you know uh, make the proper maintenance. Maybe it's the passengers of the elevator that behaved inappropriately in the elevator. So what happened in that case when we removed the driver of the elevator or the I don't know the well, the person who was responsible for managing the elevator. We um, instead place responsibility on some other party, on some other responsible agent. Um, and this is what we can do in the case of um, autonomous cars. So if an autonomous vehicle kills someone, then we should evaluate the situation and try to see like who contributed to this crash. And maybe it was several people. Maybe it was, you know, maybe it was both the passenger who behaved irresponsibly and the car malfunctioned in some crucial way. And then but they're both responsible. And this is not unique for autonomous vehicles. There are many situations where we find that there were many parties that were uh, partly responsible in a situation. It's interesting. And it, it it's particularly fascinating to in, in relation to the economy and in terms of uh, the, the way that an economy would change once you implement like vast amounts of machine learning and artificial intelligence, because well, many jobs will get replaced. And, uh, you know, there are some people who look at that kind of scenario and say, this could cause an economic collapse, you know, does and where does the responsibility land there in terms of, let's say one, let's say Google uh, cr- cranks out an incredible version of artificial intelligence that can be implemented to replace every single person in a, in a call center, every single person who's running, uh, you know, the fryer at the the McDonald's and all those different, uh, all those different kinds of jobs. If you have a, you know, a, a, a mass exodus of people from the working conditions, is the, is the company responsible for that change in the global economy or in the, in the national economy? Um, do you ever kind of think of it in terms of those terms as well for like the the large ebbs and flows of how a society will change in terms of artificial intelligence? Sure. I mean, this is a very um, a topic that's been discussed a lot. And my view is uh, maybe quite uh, uh, orthodox uh, here is that, you know, human progress uh, depends ultimately on productivity increases, you know, on innovation that gets translated into tools and uh, processes and so on, that means that we can produce more wealth, more resources, etc., with uh, less uh, human labor. Uh, and uh, I, my view is that AI could potentially become one of those tools that could you know, transform uh, the, the labor market and uh, release humans from toil, from the, you know, the necessity of toil. Uh, but of course, that uh, means that we have a, a political responsibility to um, retrain, to support individuals who, by no fault of their own, uh, have lost their jobs and need a new job. Uh, so so uh, I think there's a big political responsibility. I think that companies should participate in that process, maybe by you know paying taxes. That could be a good start. Uh, that could you know go to retraining and those kind of things. Uh, so uh, so yeah, I, I do think that companies have a responsibility uh, in in part- because they participate in in that society that that uh, needs to uh, help people to retrain or or to adapt in 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 various ways. Interesting. So the responsibility would land with government in a big way there. Yeah. Especially if it's like, yeah. capitalistic government. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I just want to bring in the transhumanist uh, perspective here because, yeah. you know, I know that this is something you write on and people have been loving it. Uh, next week, we're releasing uh, a different episode with, um, oh, goodness. Oh, I'm not even going to mention that because his name is not coming to me right now, but it's going to be fantastic. Another transhumanist conversation coming out next week. And, um, so let's talk about 
bioethics and transhumanism in respect to the AI discussion, do how do these ethical principles apply when someone's augmenting their own body with new technology? Uh, you know, is that something that is there a very libertarian perspective for you here, or, is, or should this also be governed in some way? So, I think that for me, transhumanism is a set of ideas that uh, that we it's permissible to use technology to enhance your body or to you know or, or to enhance human bodies uh, in various ways. So, so that's a kind of a a very uh, a statement that it's possible to combine with many different ideologies. So you can be a fascist, you can be a liberal, you can be a socialist, uh, you know, and and believe that that claim is true. And I happen to be a democratic socialist. So I believe that um, human enhancement, uh, I believe that it's uh, you should have extensive um, uh, permissions as an individual to enhance yourself, um, you know, who, to, to, you know, maybe there should be some um, some board that uh, regulates how uh, doctors uh, perform certain kinds of medicine. So, it, so you know, you you get rid of the quacks and so on. But but I I do believe in in extensive liberal freedoms to enhance yourself. But I also think that it's very important to complement this with a, a so social responsibility and and a, an, f an effort to uh, make uh, human enhancement inclusive. Uh, so an, an example of that uh, uh, from the Swedish case is that in about a hundred years ago, uh, there was there was this new idea that that uh, that came uh, to to many uh, advanced economies. It was fluoride in in toothpaste, uh, and it turns out that fluoride is super effective at uh, strengthening teeth and 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 you know creating strong and healthy teeth. But it was very expensive, and uh, it, it was all. Like mo mostly rich people used it, and fluoride is in one way, uh, you know, a kind of human enhancement. It, it really enhances your teeth, and, and you know, prolongs their their uh, duration and viability. Uh, and what the Swedish government instituted was something that we in Sweden called fluor tanten, which means the fluor uh, old lady. Uh, so we had in all the public schools an old lady that would have like a tray with small cups like this with fluoride solution. And she would come to uh, the class, and uh, every child would get uh, uh, take a zip of this fluoride and wash their mouth, and then spit it out. Uh, and I think this was done like uh, with like on on a regular basis. I don't know if it was every day or once a week or something like that. And uh, you know, people made fun of this institution because it was like seen as silly and so on. But this uh, institution led to major major increases in public uh, dental health. Uh, so I think this is uh, an approach that I would favor. Uh, being liberal about, you know, anyone who wants can use fluoride and uh, and the toothpaste and mouthwash and so on. But we're also going to uh, guarantee that every child also gets access to this amazing technology, uh, human enhancement technology. That's such an elegant example because it's, it's so difficult to argue against uh, you know, healthy teeth for everyone. You know, you live longer, yeah. you live a better life. Uh, I, that's yeah. a great program. I've never heard of that. Um, I, I know that there were, I, there were some similar things in the United States that uh, I've heard of. Um, so maybe that'd be interesting to dive into is, is how can we design public service, uh, you know, a government not maybe mandated or, or encouraged, uh, programs like that, that are backed up by some real data and science. Um, by the way, my guest coming out next week is James Hughes. He's uh, the oh, executive director yeah. for the Institute of Ethics and Emerging Technologies. And he, I think he has a very uh, similar perspective to you in, in these ways. It's, it's from a democratic socialistic perspective. Um, well, uh, Korean, this has been so awesome. I, I can't thank Please. you enough. I, we're we're uh, approaching an hour, so I wanted to let you go. And I know I have to go get my day started here uh, in Connecticut. So All right. <laughs> I I can't thank you enough for coming on. And, and I hope to have you on again when your some more papers are out. And so your next your book is out, perhaps. Um, so keep me posted on that. Um, and I just wanted to ask you a final question. Uh, you can, at this point, know that I've spoken to a few people, not only in, in your field, but uh, peripherally. Who's someone that you would be excited to a see on this show, but also someone that you'd be excited to sit down with and have a conversation that would push the boundaries of what you know, or that you would collaborate with 
to to do something that you've never done before. Um, do you are you aware of any organizations or individuals that you think are really kind of bring some cool and fresh ideas into this this whole uh, this whole space? Um, I think I would like to recommend uh, two of my colleagues here at the Institute for Future Studies. Um, one is uh, maybe uh, known to you, uh, Hilary Graves, uh, uh, oh, Hilary Graves. Uh, and she's the former director of the Global Priorities Institute in Oxford. And she's now doing a uh, two-year stint here, uh, doing research at the Institute for Future Studies. And she has a lot of very, very interesting uh, ideas about cause prioritization, the long-term future, effective altruism, and so on. So so that that's, uh, yeah. I would like to hear more more about her. Uh, and the other one is another colleague of me here uh, at the Institute for Future Studies, uh, Julia Mosquera. She's not as uh, famous uh, as Hillary, but uh, Julia has done a lot of work on uh, animal ethics and the ethics of disability. Uh, and we are now uh, looking uh, to uh, making a application for a project that's going to look at the issue of wild animal suffering. Uh, and how uh, how to take that into like how to consider the welfare of wild and domestic animals uh, in relation to climate change, and another project that we also want to do together uh, relates to uh, what we talked about earlier: uh, seeding the, the the stars or seeding the planets with life, because if we take the uh, hypothesis of wild animal suffering seriously, and we believe that uh, there's actually a lot of suffering going on in in the wild in, in nature then this becomes quite problematic for the prospect of spreading that life to millions and billions of worlds uh, in a way that might be irreversible you know life is very difficult to exterminate once it's already there uh, and and maybe it's a huge mistake if if what we're doing is contributing to a lot of suffering uh, in the universe, so uh, so so uh, those two people, I would. Uh, recommend. Oh, that's a fascinating. I I want to immediately dive into that with you right now because there's so many interesting, ethical conversations to have there. Um, I really appreciate that. Is uh, Hillary Graves and Julia Muscara? Is that the Mus Muscara? Yeah, Muscara. Okay, great. Um, I think I've already been in emails with Hillary. So we'll see what happens with that. And right. thank you for, uh, for Julia. I'm excited to reach out to her. Well, Green, thank you so much. I'm excited to have you on again soon. Um, and uh, please uh, let me know, you know, we're, we're, this is all, these are always ongoing conversations. Thank you so much. This has been great fun. Awesome.